We hope that you enjoyed the first day. So I just want to go over a few things this morning with everybody. So again, we want to thank the planning committee and the presenters for the great work that they've been doing on putting this program together. We want to thank all of you for attending because this wouldn't be a symposium without all the wonderful attendees. And we also want to thank all the local companies that donated towards our prize drawings. And for all the names and information, you can find that in our program book which is online at the link below that hopefully you already accessed yesterday. This is um, the agenda for today. Dr. Silas Norman will be our moderator today, and we have many wonderful, wonderful speakers that we're looking forward to hearing from as well. Nobody has anything to disclose today, nobody on the committee or any of the presenters. All of the accreditation and credit information can be found in the program book so there are three credits available for many different um, healthcare professionals um, and chaplains. So feel free to find that information in your program book. And in order to claim your credits and to also check in and complete your evaluation, we ask that you scan this QR code or go to mycme.medicine.umich.edu and you can access our evaluation, you can check in that you attended, and you can print out your certificate of credit. So now I would like to welcome Dr. Silas Norman. Dr. Norman is my fellow colleague that I enjoy working with here at Michigan Medicine. He is the director of the University of Michigan Transplant Ambulatory Care Unit, and he's also the co-medical director for the Kidney Transplant Program. So welcome to Dr. Norman. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to day two of the 10th annual Coots Calendar Drew Symposium. Uh, we appreciate your attendance this morning and you know, 10 years in is terrific and just a testament to uh, the people we celebrate, to your continued attendance and energy um, and to the organizers of this uh, conference. Um, as we get started, we'll have a couple of welcomes. Our first uh, welcome this morning is going to be uh, from Dr. David Brown. Uh, Dr. Brown is the Associate Vice President and Associate Dean for Health Equity and Inclusion and runs the Office of Health Equity and Inclusion here at the university, uh, which provides uh, some tremendous mentoring opportunities to ensure that we have a great pipeline of physicians coming up from the multicultural community to help take care of patients. Um, and this is in addition to being a practicing pediatric otolaryngologist. So we appreciate you taking time out for us this morning, David. Thank you, Dr. Norman, my pleasure. Good morning and welcome again to the 10th annual Kuntz Calendar Drew Transplant Symposium, empowering the transplant community with re resilience and vision. Um, you know, for me having uh, and serving on the state of Michigan's task force on racial disparities, uh, community action team, we realized the devastating impact of, that COVID-19 had on underrepresented communities. We all know that COVID-19 did not create healthcare disparities, but it highlighted the inequities in healthcare, access to care, biases in care, and that Black and other people of color uh, are many of the frontline workers and thus at risk for getting COVID-19. We know that COVID-19 disproportionately impacted Black, Indigenous, Pacific Islanders and uh, Latinos compared to white communities. Uh, and despite being only 12 and a half percent of the United States population, black people were more, were more than 25 percent of the deaths from COVID and three and a half times more likely to die than white people. Fortunately, the State of Michigan Task Force, through partnerships uh, with leaders in, minority, in the minority community, uh, were able to intentionally target communications via social media, television and radio. Uh, they were able to stand up trusted sources of information for minority communities, direct them toward testing sites, provide opportunities for isolation for COVID positive individuals, and be intentional about connecting minority patients to primary care physicians and expanding telehealth. Through these actions and in collaboration with a resilient minority community, uh, the state of Michigan was able to decrease the gap in COVID-19 related disparities between white communities and minority communities. This leads me to the urgency uh, to combat uh, healthcare disparities and the longstanding issue of systemic racism, which is prevalent now more than ever. 
conversations and events like this symposium are so important because they continue moving the needle toward a more educated and aware healthcare system while simultaneously creating more inclusive and equitable healthcare for our nation's most vulnerable populations. The Minority Organ Tissue Transplant Education Program has recognized that the gift of life is for all people. Transplant education is something that touches us all and advocating for equitable transplant access and education further increases health equity. I know that at Michigan Medicine, we are starting to evaluate the policies, practices, and procedures that advantage some and disadvantage others from being organ transplant recipients. This work is important for our entire community, including minority communities, to survive and thrive. During this symposium, we're all working together. We are, all, we are working across race, religion, community, job title, and across various health systems to champion resilience and equity. Thank you for your dedication, commitment, and participation, not only in this symposium, but in your continuous efforts to promote healthier communities. Welcome. Thank you, David. Our uh, next welcome is going to be uh, from Dory Dills. Dory is the CEO of Gift of Life Michigan. And, uh, you know, many of us, as we think about transplantation, we think about transplant centers, we think about the transplant surgeons um, and, and other physicians involved, but there's a whole infrastructure that supports transplantation. Um, and for us in Michigan, Gift of Life is that organ procurement organization um, that helps support what we do and helps take care of patients. Uh, and Gift of Life Michigan under Dory's leadership has been a great partner. Uh, in addition, um, uh, Ms. Dills has been a fantastic supporter of MOTEP uh, over these many years. And so we appreciate you taking time out for this uh, today and look forward to your welcome, Dory. Great. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Dr. Norman and Dr. Brown. Good morning, everyone. Again, I'm Dory Dills and I'm the CEO at Gift of Life Michigan. And I really appreciate the opportunity to welcome you to the second day of the Kuntz Calendar Drew Symposium. I hope you've enjoyed the discussion so far. I know I enjoyed hearing the speakers yesterday and it's always uh, nice to see some familiar faces. Uh, first, I, I too wanna thank the planning committee who put the symposium together, particularly this year. It has been a real challenge to uh, plan a virtual event and I appreciate their adaptation to this new format and uh, the, all the moderators and speakers who've made the program flow so smoothly. As mentioned, this is the 10th year for this event, and um, this is an event like none other, as most of our meetings have been this year. And let's face it, things are different. Everything is a little different this year. It's only fitting that the symposium is titled Empowering the Transplant Community with Resilience and Vision. At Gift of Life Michigan, through our regular outreach and through initiatives like our Let's Talk Multicultural Outreach, we provide information and engage the public in order to empower people to make the decision to donate, to save and heal lives. The resilience to weather an unprecedented global pandemic has been noted in our organization. It, is, it has um, been tremendously challenged to continue to operate uh, during COVID-19. And it has been a time where we have honored our core purpose, where uh, we honor life through donation. And the vision it'll take to find new ways to reach out to our communities now and, and in the future continues. The one positive thing to come from the need to move this symposium and other events like this into the virtual realm is that we have an opportunity to reach new people. We're not limited by the size of our room or the geography of where the meeting is held. And so I know we have a wide range of people participating yesterday and today. It's because of our willingness to adapt to new situations that I'm confident we will empower a new generation of healthcare professionals and will ultimately be successful in reducing the number of people on the waiting list and the time they have to spend there. Thank you again for your time and opportunity to speak to you day, today. I hope you enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Dory. Um, as we move to the next part of our program, I first want to just quickly uh, just show our Michigan sweatshirt here. 
And I do this uh, to help celebrate Dr. Jason Denny's great love of Michigan football. Moving on, um, our next uh, presentation is our Connect to Purpose. And we have the pleasure of having with us today, uh, Mr. Paul DeWise, who among other things happens to be a transplant recipient. Uh, I believe he was the first or one of our first uh, patients who were infected with COVID. And we're glad to see that he is recovered and able to be with us and share some words. Uh, so Paul. Hey, hello. Thank you everyone for uh, having me as part of your transplant symposium. I just wanna start out by saying I can't, I am very thankful to the gift of life and the U of M hospital for you know my, uh, my great outcome. Um, so I, I just kind of wanted to start out um, this first uh, slide here. That's me going down the tunnel at U of M Stadium after my transplant. Well, after my transplant, but um, you know that's kind of my success victory lap. So um, that's uh, just a great moment for me. Um, you can advance the slide. <laughs> So I was uh, diagnosed with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency at 37 years old. My FEV1 levels were at 45% initially. I was I started immediately on prolastin, which is uh, intravenous. Um, it, it puts the um, antitrypsin back in your system. Um, so I, I did that for 20 years. It prolonged the progression of my disease, but um, it slowly progressed over 20 years, and um, my FEV1s got down to 15%. And then I was put on the transplant list and I did have my double lung transplant at U of M Hospital um, in February of 2018. And here's me giving the thumbs up after my surgery. It took about six hours. Um, a record team, Dr. Reddy did my surgery. Dr. Chan is my uh, pulmonologist at U of M. Um, I was in the hospital for two weeks. Um, their breathing, as some people think, is was not instant. I mean, you you know, you're all hooked up to all kinds of things, and um, but uh, so after a couple of weeks, I was finally able to feel that I could breathe on my own, and it was amazing. Within three days, I was up and walking, and um, if you change the slide, please. Um, my recovery, uh, you know, it's, it's a long recovery. Uh, many doctors' visits, and I always tell people the doctors own your life for the first year of a transplant, which is a great thing. Um, you know, they tell you when to come in, they tell you when to take your medicines, they tell you what they're changing your medicines, um, bronchoscopies, all kinds of things. So, um, after two to three months, I started feeling great. I was back to work after 10 months. I was exercising, riding bike, golfing, um, playing racquetball, all kinds of great things within six months after my surgery. Um, and then six months after the surgery, I was doing great. Um, I got some very bad cases of diverticulitis. Um, after four trips to emergency and hospital stays, they finally decided to remove my coat or uh, like a foot of my colon. And then I did have a colostomy bag for six weeks um, while that healed up. I spent two more weeks in the hospital and I seriously think that was worse than my transplant as far as the pain. Um, so I had another recovery of six weeks, and then um, I was I was good to go again, and life was great, and I was back to doing everything I could do normally, and um, in advance of life. <clears throat> and then COVID nineteen set in um, in March of this year, so I was very good for you know over over a year and a half i was out doing everything i had a whole new lease on life everything's great and then on march 9th i had headache and a sore throat and then i started vomiting and having all the all the normal um symptoms of the flu went into a u of m hospital because i seriously thought i had the flu and i was told that i did not have the flu and i was just amazed because i had every single symptom there was anyway come to find out they told me they were going to do this test called the covid 19 test and the only thing i heard about that is a lot of people in china were dying at that point um and those were people were dying that had a compromised immune system so as you can imagine i was the first one at u of m to be admitted for this and when they told me i had it i seriously thought i was going to die um, but thank God for U of M people and thank God for my lung transplant. I had very strong lungs and you can advance the slide. Um, my lungs really brought me through 
um, this procedure. I never needed to be on a vent. I was in the hospital for about 11 days. Um, they had all kinds of different intravenous antibiotics, uh, lots of pain meds, a lot of sleep. Um, they did uh, do the experimental hydrochlorophene, um, but I was not on a vent. And those two nurses there were the first nurses to treat a COVID patient at U of M, and they were just awesome. Um, then I just recently, three weeks ago, I had a gallbladder attack, a uh, major attack. I was hospital for seven days. They took my gallbladder out. Um, all kinds of you know strange things happened with that. But once again, I'm back. I'm back to normal. Um, I just had my stent taken out two days ago, and I have no pain, and life is good once again. So I've had several things going on, but what I wanted to, you know, kind of, you know, let everyone know is that I've never given up. I've always had a huge, very, very positive attitude. I surround myself with great family, friends. I lean on them. Um, my transplant team, the transplant support groups, Gift of Life, Donate Life, my donor um, family. You know, I just can't say enough good about remaining positive and always, always looking for the good in everything. Um, there's a picture here of me and Dr. Chan. I was able to um, actually, uh, with along with my workplace, um, do a couple, um, a lung force walk and some other things to um, raise some money. And we were able to donate $5,000 to the transplant center. And um, they were able to buy these um, these bags for transplant people when they go home um, so with some nice goodies inside of them. Um, so that's great. Um, and, you know, another thing is I, I highly suggest to people in order to keep, you know, resilient and, you know, bounce back from, you know, something like this, um, I set small little goals for myself, uh, you know, so you just got to celebrate the small things in life, um, one day at a time, you know, your first steps, like for me, it was walking one block and then I'd walk for a little while longer and say, okay, I got, I can get up to this next house and turn around and the next day go three more houses. So anyway, um, just never give up and keep on going. Um, next slide, please. Um, as we all know, life is full of challenges. You just have to be resilient. Um, one of my main things I always told my family was that once I have a lung transplant, a successful one, we're going to Hawaii. So that's a picture of my family there, my three daughters and my wife. And we went to Hawaii and just had a great time. Um, some of the things that, uh, you know, help me be resilient and I strongly suggest for others is, you know, follow the doctor's orders, um, do things that make you happy. Um, you know, for me, it's exercise. It's, uh, you know, keeping my friends close, remain open and flexible. You know, all kinds of things go on with the transplant and COVID and all the things that are happening. You just got to remain open and try different things and, and work hard to uh, keep positive. Um, take action. Another huge thing I, I just have always, um, you have to take charge of your own life. And I did this and I just did it recently with several doctors. I was having some major pains from my gallbladder surgery. I really, you know, put some demands down and, and they were able to get me in for surgery two weeks early because I was in so much pain. And after that surgery two days ago, I'm totally feeling better. So you really have to know your body. You know it better than the doctors do. You need to be able to help them to help you. So um, you have to have a good sense of humor. And, um, you know, I, I feel very strongly in living life to the fullest. You never know what tomorrow's going to bring. So you've got to have fun. you got to enjoy life. And again, I'm so thankful for U of M, my family, my support groups, um, everyone for being there by my side. I plan on living a long, long time with these new lungs and life is great. So the last thing I wanna just read really quickly is this is what uh, U of M gave me. Transplantation is an amazing journey that tests the limits of human strength and courage. It requires commitment and faith, as well as mental, emotional, and physical endurance. If you can handle transplantation, you can conquer anything you set your mind to. It's one of life's greatest challenges among the rewards itself, or, the, or among the rewards is life itself. And that's kind of how I live my life. And I just think that's very fitting to end my presentation. 
So that's that's what I have. Um, Outstanding. We appreciate you sharing that. Um, a lot there, you know, certainly just seeing those pictures uh, of you with your family uh, just kind of helps uh, center us back around why we do this and, and what we'd like to see out of this. Um, I wonder if you might comment. I thought one of the most important things you talked about was being you know, your own health advocate. Um, maybe if you could tell the audience a little bit, how did you go about that? How do you uh, establish well, that? Sure. Well, I, you know, all along. So I've had alpha one antitrypsin for 20 years. I was diagnosed and, you know, I, I learned early on that, you know, alpha one antitrypsin isn't a known disease that well. And, you know, even some of my pulmonary early pulmonary doctors didn't even really know much about it. I had to research it and make sure I knew what was going on. I knew all my FEV1 levels and all my different breathing tests. I kept uh, notebooks and binders of it all because I just found, I just found that you know, there wasn't a whole lot of research and different things done. So from the very beginning, I started just kind of knowing my life and knowing how I felt and those kinds of things. So I just always took it in my own hands to question my doctors, you know, okay, well, this is going on. Why is this going on? My body aches, you know, my whole body aches, different things are going on. I understand this, this, and this, but why, why are other things happening? So they've been, um, you know, I've just kind of taking it all into my own hands and just, um, you know, just make sure I understand what's going on with my body. Like I said, I know my body, I know when things are out of whack and I share those things with the doctors. And one of the huge things for transplant people, you know, my, you know, Dr. Chan, Dr. Lou, everyone has always told me, anytime you have anything go wrong, you need to call emergency right away or call us. And every time I do, they, you know, if, if it's treatable or if they need me to go in, I go into emergency and, um, and, and, and get treated. So, you know, that's, that's kind of how I just, I feel very strongly about taking control and, and, and knowing what's going on in your body. You know, don't just take the doctor's word for it. You got to really, you know, understand. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, we appreciate uh, your words this morning. It sets us off on, on the right uh, right mindset for the rest of the day. We appreciate you taking the time, and, and we're glad to see you up and around and doing well. Great. Thank you. I'm loving Thanks. life. Thanks. All right. So next up, so uh, just have to reinforce that that message of being your own best health advocate and making sure you, you challenge us and ask the questions you need to make sure that, that we take care of your health. Fantastic. Next up, we have the pleasure of having with us uh, Dr. Danae Simpson. Dr. Simpson is a uh, transplant surgeon at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. And uh, important to us today, she is the founding director of the Northwestern Medicine African American Transplant Access Program, which is committed to eliminating disparities in, in transplant among underserved uh, populations in the Chicago area. And we are excited to uh, hear your presentation and your words this morning, Dr. Simpson. And you're muted, uh, Dr. Simpson. Okay, great. Can you guys hear me now? Absolutely. Okay, excellent. Um, thank you so much for that introduction. And I am so excited uh, to be here and presenting um, at this important symposium. MOTEP has been a constant um, inspiration for the work that I've done. And so I'm very happy to, to give this presentation to you all. So, you know, back, gosh, I, I think it's probably almost a year ago, uh, I was approached by um, Stacy and Ramonia and, and Tanya to give a presentation about creating partnerships in the community. And so I thought that this would be an excellent uh, opportunity to talk about how I partnered with the African-American, the black community here in Chicago um, to help combat the disparities that they face uh, when trying to access the transplant process. Um, you know, I have a couple of disclaimers. One is that um, I tend to be a storyteller. So this is going to seem kind of like a journey, you know, as, as I tell this story. And the other disclaimer is that, you know, I am a simple surgeon, just looking for solutions for my community, for my family, 
Um, I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm not a social scientist, although I would like to say I'm a budding social scientist at this point. Um, but really what I am presenting to you is just my quest um, and, my, and everybody who's you know, helped this program along, our quest to uh, create an equal playing field for our communities. This work uh, started, in, you know, when this inspiration first started for me, when I was a trainee, um, a general surgery trainee in Boston, and I rotated on the transplant service for the very first time. And uh, that first, in the morning time, we did a, a kidney transplant, a living donor kidney transplant, and I was hooked immediately. There was nothing more gratifying than seeing a pale, lifeless kidney turn pink and make urine on the table. And so instantly I knew this is where I needed to be, but not, nothing more solidifying than my experience later that afternoon, which was our evaluation clinic. It was our kidney evaluation clinic. And, and so the way they uh, structured that clinic for the trainees is that we were essentially like apprentices. We, we went you know, side by side with the faculty. We would actually be the first people in the patient's room. And so we had six patients that we were evaluating that day. And I was floored to find that all six of the patients were black. And I realized, and I made a mental note to myself, there's something about kidney disease that I haven't learned yet. And, um, and I, I promised myself that after the clinic, I would go back uh, to the literature and read more about this. And in my surgical training so far, I hadn't really learned about how kidney disease disproportionately affects us. And so the other thing that was really profound to me was how patients received me when I walked into the room. Uh, each, each patient had kind of a double take when they saw me and, and would kind of have a, a moment to kind of process this black face that was walking in the room. And I was greeted with tears in some rooms, hugs, handshakes, and overwhelmingly um, the message, Doc, I'm so glad to see you. I'm so glad to see you, you know, me looking the way that I looked, I was providing something to these patients without having given them a lick of medical advice. So that was very profound to me. And from that moment forward, especially after I went to the literature and saw how profoundly uh, kidney disease affects blacks, uh, black Americans, I, I decided that I, I needed to, to to do something about this and that I needed to create something. And, and along the way, as I was, investigating how uh, kidney disease affected black individuals, I came across the MOTEP and Dr. Callender's work. And this was my main inspiration for doing this work. So as I talk about this to others, and as I try to, you know, build the story for why a program like this needs, to, why a program like this needs to exist, you know, a lot of people ask me, well, yes, you know, kidney disease affects Black Americans and, and, and Black individuals across the country disproportionately, but why do you need to have a specific program? Like, why can't they just navigate the healthcare system like everybody else? And so there's a few, a few things that I want to present. Um, the first is this map of kidney disease in the United States. And so um, one thing that I found that many of my colleagues uh, in medicine don't know, and certainly uh, the layperson, the patient outside of healthcare doesn't know, is how profoundly kidney disease affects the United States. And, you know, I, I think that I, I use kidney disease to build the case for a program like uh, ATAP, as I called it, that's our acronym, African American Transplant Access Program. Um, but, you know, this is the case for any other transplant process, whether we're talking liver transplant, heart transplant, you name it, the disparities are there. Um, kidney is very, uh, it illustrates this very well. And so uh, 30 million Americans roughly have chronic kidney disease, and that's 13% of our population. Usually when I lay that uh, factor out there or that, that fact that usually causes a bit of a jaw drop. I mean, people really just don't realize this. And mostly that's because kidney disease tends to be a silent disease. You can't really look at somebody outwardly and know that they have it. Another fact that, that many, many people don't know is that African-Americans are four times more likely to develop kidney disease. And even though we represent 13% of the US population, we represent 35% of all Americans suffering from kidney disease. So this is where the disparity kind of starts. We have a supply and a demand issue. 
And, um, but that's not where it ends. And so next I like to talk about the transplant process because, and, and, I, and I know that Dr. Callender can probably tell us stories from earlier days when the transplant committee was just uh, coming into play as part of the transplant process. And it, the, the transplant committee is designed to make this process more equitable. We have a demand problem. We have many more people who need kidneys or any other organ, you can insert any organ in this story, um, than, than who, who can get one. And, um, and so therefore we need to have a process to make sure that we're distributing these as fairly as possible. And so for those of you who haven't been inside of a transplant uh, committee meeting, this is kind of how the process works. It's a concentric circle process. And, and the way I, I, I illustrate it this way, because what the circles represent is the population. And so as one moves through this process, more and more people fall off. Now, part of that is intentional because as people are early in their disease process, they're not yet ready to be referred on to say, see a nephrologist or to a transplant referral. And so part of this is by design, but another part of, of this sort of attrition as we move down step-by-step step is because of disparities and lack of access. Um, there are some considerations for listing and I've listed these on the screen. And these are your sort of really objective reasons that you can say, okay, you have advanced kidney disease, you needed to be referred to a nephrologist, you are now here for transplant evaluation. And because of these objective reasons, you are not a transplant candidate. And so these are certain comorbidities, and this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, there are many, many other uh, objective reasons that we can rule somebody out for transplant. Um, but I've listed here, you know, cardiopulmonary disease, a, a coexisting cancer, uh, certain anatomical issues, issues with the blood vessels. I always give the analogy of plumbing when we're doing a transplant, you know, you have to have good pipes to plug that organ into. So if a patient has vascular disease, they are objectively not a candidate. Obesity um, can be um, a, an objective reason to rule someone out. It's a modifiable reason. It's something that can change with time. But if somebody is morbidly obese, they uh, may be ruled out at further candidacy. Psychosocial, um, is, is a more gray area, and, um, but the, the sort of harder aspects of, of psychosocial category that we can rule somebody out is insurance. Um, that's, that's very much more cut and dry than say compliance or support. Um, but this is what the transplant process looks like. And, and as, again, this was put in place to make the process equitable, yet it's not. And so I want to read to you a few, and this is not an exhaustive list either, but these are a few of the disparities that are um, documented in the medical literature uh, when it comes to Black patients accessing the transplant process. Black patients are less likely to be referred to a nephrologist prior to the initiation of chronic dialysis. Uh, I don't know if any of you have heard the term crashing onto dialysis, but this is a term that many of my patients tell me. When I meet them for the first time and I'm getting a history of how they came to be in my clinic, they say, well, you know what, doc, I thought I was fine. And then one day I woke up on dialysis. And, um, and these are patients that have access to the healthcare system at, at many points prior to this and likely had many uh, warning signs that, that kidney disease was there or that it was becoming more ad advanced, yet they hadn't been referred to a nephrologist. When Black patients are referred to nephrologists, they are more likely to be referred at advanced stages of kidney disease. Uh, we are less likely to complete a kidney evaluation and be listed. And as we're going through and navigating this transplant process, we have lower access to living donor transplants. We tend to wait longer once we get listed, and then the disparity doesn't stop there. Once we are listed or we receive a transplant, we have lower rates of graft survival. And again, this is not just for kidney disease. As I said, you can insert any other organ there. Um, I am also a liver transplant surgeon, so uh, I, I decided to share with you some of the disparities that we do documented from a study that we did here in Chicago. Black patients, we found, were more likely to be listed at higher MELD scores, so that, that index of, of how sick a patient is from liver disease. Uh, black patients are less likely to receive a transplant and more likely to die or become too ill for transplantation. And in Chicago, Black patients have the highest rate of all-cause mortality and non-liver-related death. 
we are less likely to be listed or transplanted, and we are significantly more likely to have a liver-related death. So, you know, I, when, when we talk about these disparities and when I talk about these disparities with others, uh, the underlying question is why do these exist? And I think that um, a common and dangerous default is the thinking that this is somehow uh, a genetic issue. And while genetics are certainly at play um, in, in, in a, it is a small part of, of this problem, it's certainly not the overwhelming reason. Uh, Dr. Kalarinder shared with us yesterday the, um, the contribution of APOL1 and how having two uh, variants will, will put a patient at higher risk for developing kidney disease. And, um, but that is certainly not um, the, the only reason and certain, not even the major reason uh, that, that patients have, have kidney disease. And, and really, um, it's, it's racism at play here. And when I say racism to, to folks, people tend to think of kind of that interpersonal racism, that one-on-one, -on -one, me on you kind of um, interaction. And that's, that's not really what I mean. Um, what I'm talking more about is institutional and structural racism. And Mr. Dawes spoke very powerfully about this yesterday. But also at play is internalized racism. Uh, Mr. Espy spoke yesterday about, um, you know, needing to, to, to feel and say to oneself, I'm worth it. Uh, that, you know, I, I'm worth getting through the transplant process. Internalized racism is where we have this self-devaluation and acceptance of these repeated negative messages that come to us um, from majority groups. And, um, and so all of these are at play when, when in, in creating these disparities. And so um, these, 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 especially in, uh, institutional and structural racism is what give rise to our social determinants of health. Okay, and again, Mr. Dawes gave a very powerful uh, presentation yesterday about not only the social determinants of health, but the political determinants of health, which is something that I hadn't thought so much about. So that was very eye-opening for me. But the social determinants of health are the environments in which we are born, we live, we learn, work, play, worship, et cetera, we age. And um, it, that's not equal for everybody. Um, you know, some, a couple of examples of social determinants that may affect an individual's ability to navigate the transplant process is, um, you know, uh, health, uh, access to specialty health care. You know, I mentioned earlier that one of the major disparities is that Black individuals are less likely to be referred to an, a nephrologist. Access to transplant, uh, transportation is another issue. Uh, crime in, in the neighborhood and, and safety and the conditions in which one lives is also another issue. And so what I'd like to do now is give you a tour of Chicago because, you know, this program is very specific to Chicago. It's something that I think needs um, to be implemented nationally for sure. But Chicago, I think, is, is really the perfect city to illustrate how social determinants of health, how structural and institutional racism have put the black community at a significant disadvantage and perpetuate, have created and perpetuate all these disparities that I discussed in earlier slides. Chicago, as many know, is a very diverse city and I love Chicago for that, but we also know that Chicago is a very segregated city. So this is a pie chart of the demographics in the city. You know, when we talk about black, white, Hispanic, Latinx, uh, Chicago is roughly a third, a third, a third. So, you know, we have a great contribution from all these different race ethnicities in our city. Now this map here shows the map of Chicago and the different colors show where these different racial and ethnic groups tend to live. Again, um, underscoring the, um, the seg segregated nature of our city. So the blue dots are where our African-American communities tend to be clustered and you can see them clustered very heavily on the south side and the west side. And so I want you to keep those locations in mind as I move through these next maps, demonstrating um, structural racism and the social and political now uh, determinants of health. So look at the brown on this map and this overlaps perfectly with our black communities in Chicago. And these represent food deserts. 
Food deserts are nearly exclusively African-American in Chicago. I remember learning about the concept of food deserts, I, I believe it was sometime in medical school, and I really thought that that was something that was for developing countries. I didn't think that that would be an issue here in the United States. Yeah, here we are um, in 2020, and Chicago being uh, a major um, haven for, for food deserts, and it overlaps with our, our Black communities. The picture that you see here is, is a um, shopping plaza. And you can see that we have a Dollar Tree here and a DaVita dialysis clinic. This used to be a grocery store. And this is the case in many of our black and brown communities across Chicago. Uh, now in this particular community, and this is the Washington Heights community on the far south side, and this is where I do a lot of my community work. Um, this is these the, the 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 people who live in this neighborhood now need to drive outside of their neighborhood or they need to catch a bus or two buses outside of their neighborhood to get access to healthy food and so one can imagine how that would impact their ability to say um adhere to a restrictive diet such as the renal diet or the cirrhosis diet um, it affects their abilities to uh, keep their weight down or to manage their diabetes. These next two maps um, are also maps of Chicago, as I mentioned. Again, focusing on the south side and the west side, which are our black and brown communities in Chicago. Uh, and you can see that those are also areas of heavy concentration for hypertension and diabetes. Not a surprise because this is where our food deserts are. Right. And so you can imagine that if you have poor access to healthy food options, that diabetes is going to come. Hypertension is going to come. And that is, uh, you know, sad, but then not surprising to find that in those same areas, this is where chronic kidney disease is concentrated in our city because diabetes and high blood pressure are the number one and number two causes of kidney disease. And so you can see how this layers on top of uh, each other, one insult after another, and puts these communities at significant disadvantage and really builds these disparities. The map with the green on it uh, demonstrates a specialty desert in Chicago. So again, looking at the south and the west of the city, these are where our black and brown communities are clustered. And um, you can see a, of an abundance of blue dots. And this is where dialysis clinics are. I mean, and, and this is something that all of my patients will say to me, they say, doc, there is a dialysis clinic on every corner. Like I, I can't go a block without finding a dialysis clinic. Yet, if you look for the red squares, these are our nephrologists. Specialty care are, is not in these neighborhoods. So again, specialty deserts, food deserts. One of my community partners has also documented a pharmacy desert. So in these same neighborhoods, pharmacies are closing down at alarming rates. And so patients are finding that they need to travel outside of their neighborhood. Again, one, two bus rides, longer car rides to get to a pharmacy. When you have these groups that are so comorbid, they have chronic kidney disease, diabetes, they're reliant on medications. And if they can't access those readily, this puts them at extreme disadvantage. And then finally, on our map tour, I have a neighborhood, uh, the neighborhood life expectancy in Chicago. And this is uh, some work that Mr. Dawes had also referenced yesterday, just how we have a difference in life expectancy in our black and brown communities compared to our white communities. And so again, looking at our south and west sides, the dark red and oranges, um, and then if you look at the lighter colors, this is uh, where our white communities and our more affluent communities tend to be. There is almost a 30 year difference in life expectancy. So this is the story that Chicago tells. I think it illustrates how racism, social determinants of health really are the major underpinning of disparities when it comes to any disease process mostly, but really for transplant, which is what I'm focused on. So again, racism uh, giving rise to uh, differences in our social determinants of health, which will create and uh, perpetuate disparities. 
So if you go back to our transplant process, this concentric circle slide that I showed to you, um, looking at how one will move through this process, this is really not how it looks. Um, again, I, I told you that this process was designed to be, uh, to, to, to make the transplant process equitable, but really what it looks like is, is this. Um, as patients are trying to move through this process, through the screening and diagnosis to get referred to a specialist, to get referred for transplant, to eventually be listed and be transplanted, many, many patients are falling off this path because of structural racism, institutional racism, internalized racism, and moving back into chronic dialysis. And this is why we're seeing the disparities that I mentioned earlier. So one of my favorite quotes um, from Dr. Martin Luther King is here, which is of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. And I show this slide because this was something that he said at a speech here in Chicago, I believe in 1968. And we are so far away from that date, yet it doesn't seem like much has changed. And so this is my justification for creating a program like the African American Transplant Access Program. And so I've listed our vision and our mission statement here. And so we say enabling our community through awareness, access and advancement. Northwestern Medicine's Comprehensive Transplant Center has committed to a campaign to eliminate disparities for black residents of the greater Chicagoland area in relation to transplant care for kidney and liver disease. We are dedicated to the development of a deeper understanding of the historical barriers and cultural concerns of the African American community and strive to work together with the community to overcome these obstacles. Through our program, we aim to increase awareness, improve access, and provide excellent outcomes through community engagement which is the most important piece here, participatory research and patient and provider education. And so ATAP was born. Uh, we have four major pillars of the program that, uh, that make up ATAP. And so we have cultural competency, health literacy and diet, psychosocial and trust. And I, I draw this this way in this circle because this is really a continuum. One is not more important than the other. One is shouldn't be focused on necessarily before the other. They're all very intertwined. One will affect the other. But where I like to start is where a, a cultural competency or, and, and, and because I think that learning from our community, engaging with our community is the first step we need to make when we're partnering with our community. We really have to let our community lead the way. Um, this is a picture of me down on the far south side of Washington Heights in one of the local libraries holding a meeting pre-COVID um, to talk about um, the kidney health and what it means to that community and, and, and what uh, they think of when they think of kidney health and, and being health, healthy in, in general. And you know, one of the things that uh, the literature will tell us and, and I have learned personally is that um, many, many disparities have been documented, but you can't show up to a community and say, hey, this is what you need. You have to let the community tell you what they need. Uh, that's the only way that an intervention is going to be effective. And so you have to also meet the community where they are. Um, you know, Northwestern is, is up in an area that we call the Gold Coast and um, can be challenging to, uh, to access, particularly for patients who are at the beginning phases of this process and still have a lot of distrust and skepticism. And so meeting the community where they are is incredibly important. And that underscores the importance of community events, satellite clinics, and dialysis center visits. Um, the next pillar of the ATAP program is trust. And as many of us know, our history has built a foundation for distrust in this country. Uh, many of us know, you know, the first, the first thing that comes to mind is the Tuskegee um, uh, experiment. And so I've shown some pictures here um, of, of that ongoing. You know, I think that when we talk about this, the tendency for, for many folks who are kind of outside of this, where this doesn't really affect them or their communities, their tendency is to think, well, you know, this was so long ago, but it really isn't. Um, this, is, this is something that affected my grandparents. You know, these are stories that my grandmother told to me 
um, and my mother tells me, and these are stories that my parents recall when they are navigating the healthcare system and they are skeptical about the care that they're receiving. Um, additionally, there was the eugenics experiment um, that, that happened, and this was you know, uh, funded and, and supported by the federal government, uh, which was uh, a project to improve the qualities of the human family. And uh, this was interesting when you read about it because there were several qualities that they thought were heritable, which were pauperism, criminality, which we know is not something that's heritable. But this led to the forced uh, sterilization, unbeknownst to many women, um, through over over a, a number of decades, and and led to gosh, uh, hundreds of thousands of hysterectomies, um, which became known as the Mississippi appendectomy, where women would go in with another complaint and come out with a hysterectomy. Um, so so these are not the only stories that our history has. We have the story of Henrietta Lacks, um, J. Marion Sims, and what he contributed to uh, modern obstetrics and gynecology. And, and, and doing that with unwilling and unconsenting black slave women. Uh, so this is our history and it's remembered and this builds distrust in our community. And then sort of deepening that distrust and, and creating uh, an even more challenging barrier to overcome are myths and misconceptions. And I know that those on the donor side of transplant deal with a lot of these myths and misconceptions as well, which really create the barriers to one becoming an organ donor. And I've listed the more common myths and misconceptions that I've come across, which is, you know, transplant is still experimental. Uh, survival is the same for dialysis patients who get transplanted. And, you know, if I'm going to get go through the transplant and, and not have any improvement in survival, why would I take all those medications? Why would I go under the knife? These are what patients say to me. White people get priority on the list wealthy or famous people get priority on the list. And then um, when we talk specifically about living donation, there's this incredible fear for living donors, uh, also rooted in myth and misconception. And so a major um, intervention of the ATAP program is to uh, try to intervene on, on, on these, these myths and misconceptions and try to recreate and re-earn the trust of our communities. And again, that is going to only be achieved by going into the community, showing them that we're there, showing them that we're not just there to get information for a study and then run away and leave them with nothing. That's one of the major worries and concerns of minority communities when they see a big academic center come in. And so it requires a, a, a significant investment of time to rebuild that trust. Uh, this is uh, one of my favorite transplant couples. We, we, we just finished a story uh, with ABC News. This is a daughter who donated to her mother. And um, this woman, the, uh, the patient, did not want to start dialysis. Uh, she was struggling significantly um, from the, her end stage kidney disease, but because of distrust, because of different myths and misconceptions that she held, she was willing to die at home. Um, and her daughter reached out to ATAP and through a series of visits and interventions, we um, not only uh, managed to help this woman move over to dialysis, but then to shortly afterwards, receive a living donor kidney transplant from her daughter. The next uh, pillar of the ATAP program is health literacy and diet. And, and those are actually very tightly intertwined. Uh, a common misconception about health literacy is that it is some measure of educational attainment, and it definitely is not. Um, health literacy as it's defined, um, is the degree to which individuals can obtain, process, and understand basic health information that's needed to make appropriate health decisions. Somebody who has a PhD can be health illiterate, the same as somebody who has a high school education. Um, so it is, it is incredibly important in navigating the listing process. Uh, the literature shows us that limited health literacy is very common and non-white individuals with chronic kidney disease, and that this is magnified by distrust. So you have distrust, you have um, limited health literacy, and this creates a very toxic mix for patients trying to navigate 
the, uh, the transplant process. And so therefore it's not a surprise that the patients who end up making it through the process um, tend to not have an issue with health literacy because the process selects um, for those individuals and, and those who are suffering from limited health literacy tend to fall by the wayside. Um, moving on to diet and how that, that is kind of intertwined, um, you know, there's very limited data on this actually in, in the literature and a lot of my observations about this are by anecdote. Um, but uh, black food preferences can be different. Uh, we don't eat different food. We prepare it differently oftentimes, um, but there is very limited data on the impact of our food preferences and how we prepare our food and how that impacts on the renal diet or adhering to the cirrhosis diet. We, many of us know that those diets are profoundly restrictive, um, particularly in salt content, but also um, you know, protein, phosphorus, other things, uh, fluid. And according to this very limited literature, only 30% of black individuals are compliant, compliant with the renal diet. Um, you know, now think back about the maps that I showed, uh, the prevalence of food deserts, um, talking about poor health literacy, and you complicate that with a very restrictive diet, these patients are set up to fail. Um, and one thing I notice is that as we, as a transplant committee, evaluate patients for this very precious uh, um, resource that we have, our organs that we don't have enough of to give around. We have to somehow um, select who will who will be a candidate and who will not. And we rely on whether or not a patient will take care of this organ. So are they gonna be compliant? And so one of the things we tend to rely on are dialysis records and, and emergency room visits. So, um, you know, if we're relying on those records, if a patient is continually showing up in their dialysis center overweight or in the emergency room in volume overload because of uh, dietary indiscretion or non-compliance, this will be perceived as a patient who won't take care of their organ and they can be uh, deemed not a candidate for transplant when this is really rooted in all of these barriers um, around food deserts, poor health literacy, and poor understanding of uh, the restriction of these diets. Uh, here's a, an interesting uh, chart from a paper where they looked at dialysis patients by race or ethnicity and, and the different areas where they seem to struggle the most in terms of being adherent to the renal diet. And so for black patients, uh, their main trouble spot seemed to be fluid. And um, and if I were to have put up all the other different ethnicities, and I, I didn't want to do that for crowding the slide, but uh, the different trouble spots were different by ethnic group. And so for Black patients, uh, fluid was the issue. And so I think most people would think, well, that would mean that they're drinking too much water, you know, they're not adhering to their fluid restrictions. But actually, when you look at the dietary recall, um, for uh, these patients, the main issue is high sodium foods. Well, that really speaks to an inability to understand how to read food labels, to lack of uh, access to foods that might be lower in sodium. Food deserts are known uh, for um, individuals who will eat processed foods and, and fast foods uh, because that's all that's available to them. So you can see how all of this interplays on one another. This is actually our, our first patient pair um, from the ATAP program. So this is a, a couple of years ago. And this was a couple who you wouldn't know by looking at them now, but really, really struggled with weight and were told at a number of different centers that they weren't transplant candidates. And um, this son donated to his mother successfully after um, you know, receiving support from nutrition services and the ATAP program. Um, and they both successfully lost the weight. They've kept it off. Um, and it's really an amazing uh, story to see. And, and I really love to, to revisit the story when we talk about um, the impact of, of diet and, and, and those barriers on uh, Black patients as they try to navigate the transplant process. And then finally, we have psychosocial, and this is a really, really broad area, and this provides uh, a lot of opportunities to 
uh, to discriminate against different patients as they navigate the transplant process, sadly. Support is one of the big things that we look for when we're trying to determine whether or not a patient is just a transplant candidate. They have to have support from family members or friends, somebody who can drive them back and forth to appointments, somebody who can be with them 24 seven for the first few weeks. Well, um, if you think back to our social determinants of health and in and, and the type of environments and, and socioeconomic conditions that our black and brown communities tend to live in, many of these patients don't have the luxury of taking time off or, or their family and friends don't have the luxury of taking time off to be with them around the clock, to bring them back and forth to appointments and what have you. And so this sets up uh, a, a disparity. It sets these patients up to to you know have unequal access to transplant. And this is just from a study where they show that younger patients, in particular, um, tended to report that they felt that they were unsupported or didn't have support from their family and friends uh, when it came to uh, navigating the transplant process. Other contributors to psychosocial disparity that I don't have time to talk about today, I mentioned a little bit about socioeconomic status, mental illness as well. So, you know, a patient's uh, mental um, fortitude, as it would be assessed by a social worker or a psychiatrist or psychologist as they're um, navigating the transplant process. There's a huge stigma of mental illness in, in the African-American community. And so just being approached by a psychiatrist or a psychologist as part of the eval process can put up an instant wall. And so these are things that we need to navigate as well. Um, the last patient story that I will share with you has to do something with support. And so this is a young woman, she's only 40, and she's been on dialysis for 11 years. She was delisted at a neighboring center uh, for non-compliance here in Chicago. And uh, this was because they looked at her dialysis records and they showed uh, that she would have been skipping dialysis appointments. And so their uh, assumption and uh, conclusion was that this woman was not going to take care of her kidney because she was not compliant with the dialysis orders that she had been given. What the reality was is that this woman was the sole provider for her two dependent children, and she was at her wit's end and near giving up. If you listened to her and looked at her dialysis records more closely, you would find that she would skip her dialysis appointments if her child was sick or needed to be taken to the doctor or had some type of school event, but she would reschedule for the following day. And this is how she would make being a single mom work. We have to have more flexibility around these types of situations. With further digging, we found that her father was a potential support, but he had no reliable means of transportation. We need to come up with creative solutions for our patients to help them get through the transplant process. This woman has 11 years of waiting time. If she got transplanted, imagine how her narrative would change in terms of being able to care for her family, to be able to care for herself, to be able to get a job and find reliable transportation. And so judging patients based on the lack of those means is really, in my opinion, the wrong way to go about this. Um, this woman, unfortunately, I can't give you a, um, a happy ending saying that she's been transplanted as she's moved through the process and we have come up with some creative solutions for her. We unfortunately found a breast mass, so she's having that worked up and, and hopefully we're praying um, that uh, this will not be a cancer and hopefully she can um, re-engage with the transplant process and be transplanted. So in conclusion, uh, sometimes being an advocate for a patient at the committee meeting or um, what have you can make all the difference for that patient, but oftentimes it takes a whole lot more than that. And that's what ATAP is about. Um, you know, you need a champion. Uh, a champion is needed to, to have a program like this, to go into the community and meet with patients. Uh, we do need to understand the literature and all the numerous, numerous disparities that have been documented there, but we also have to let our community lead the way. We have to talk with our community and hear from them what they need and, um, and create our interventions around that. And we have to employ a multi-pronged intervention. The literature um, has very few interventions. There, there, there's a lot of disparities that they document, very few interventions. But many of these interventions are single pronged approaches and we need a comprehensive approach to really um, meet the needs of our communities. And so with that, I thank you very much for this opportunity to talk about this program at this really important program. Again, I, I 
MOTEP has been such an inspiration to me. Um, so it is such a privilege to be able to present on this platform. Outstanding, Dr. Simpson. Thank you so much for that uh, 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 potpourri of information. I think it was uh, both inspirational, uh, gives us a lot to think about, uh, a lot to learn about. Um, in the time we have, I wonder, we could talk with you all morning about this, but I wonder if I could ask you uh, just one or two questions uh, from the chat. One was you brought up uh, the selection, uh, the transplant evaluation selection uh, committee meetings and, and how in theory these are unbiased meetings, but in fact, we all come to these meetings with our own biases and, and assumptions. Um, uh, comments that, uh, were uh, questions, how do you address sort of uh, what might be microaggressions or prejudicial microaggressions in, in those meetings. Um, and a related question is for your colleagues who are happy with the way things are, how do you, you bring along our colleagues who, who are not necessarily interested in, in changing practice so we can uh, be more fair to our patients? Yeah. Um, thank you for those questions. I, I, I think it's been a process and it's been a learning process for me how to navigate this. Um, I realize that um, as we all know, uh, the topic of racism, of bias, of implicit bias is a, a challenging topic to discuss, particularly with those who feel that they are not challenged by this and that this isn't an issue for them and that they feel that the process is working fine. Um, one of the things that I really find works the best is to present data. Um, nobody wants to hear an anecdote, um, but if you present data, when I show these maps of Chicago, and I show the disparities in the literature, that really is an eye opener for many uh, of, of my colleagues and, and people um, outside of my department. When I was pitching this program to our hospital leadership, for example, you know, when you, when you see this, this is undeniable, this is data, this is not you know, an anecdote of saying, well, this patient felt this way when you said this to them. These are the reasons that a program like this needs to exist. And um, you know, we can see how, you know, bias can be built in when, when these patients are coming from these disadvantaged situations. But when you learn about it, it kind of helps facilitate that conversation. Excellent. And one of the other questions was, um, in supporting ATAP, is this uh, fully supported by Northwestern or is there uh, some partnership with the community partners that you work with? Um, it, is, it, is, it is fully supported by Northwestern. Um, but we partner with our community. So, you know, I partner, I'm on the board of directors for the National Kidney Foundation of Illinois. Um, and so I work very closely with them and their community engagement. Um, and um, I work closely with our OPO with Gift of Hope. Um, and we, you know, we'll work together, say for National Minority Donor Awareness Month, you know, we put together a Facebook Live to reach out to the black community about disparities when um, in organ donation. Um, I have uh, connected with the American Liver Foundation of the Greater Lakes region. So different advocacy groups. I have connected with a number of churches in uh, Chicago area because as we know the church is very, very important to us and um, is really a pillar of trusted information to our black communities. And so I, I, have, I have interacted with a number of community members, but in terms of the support of the program, particularly the financial support that comes from Northwestern. And I'm very, actually very fortunate to have their 200% support behind this program. It's really been phenomenal. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, great information. Thank you again uh, for coming and presenting uh, to us. We wish you the best with the program. And, and I think there's so much that we could potentially do in other cities in our own uh, locations uh, uh, to potentially emulate that program and, and do some good for people. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, moving to our uh, last uh, set of presentations, uh, we are fortunate to have with us a couple representatives from CMS, from the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Studies. Um, we often think about transplant as just the clinical side of it, but there's also a whole regulatory side to transplant uh, that dictates uh, how we practice, what the incentives uh, uh, for practice are, how we're reimbursed. They really affect how we're able to deliver care for patients. So uh, we are fortunate this morning to have with us both uh, Melissa Dorsey, uh, who's the Acting Deputy Director in the Division of Kidney Health, uh, as well as Krishna Patel, 
who is the uh, co-lead for the end-stage kidney disease treatment choices learning collaborative uh, within the division of kidney health. And they will share with us, I think, some information about the new ETC choices and what that means uh, for how we practice. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Norman, and thank you for all the presenters that are here today. It was actually really, really, really nice to hear from um, Dr. Simpson just now and hearing her presentation. It was really, really inspiring um, and lots of work to do. Um, today, um, for, the, for this presentation, as Dr. Norman just mentioned, um, my name is Melissa Dorsey. I'm from CMS. I am no longer the acting. <laughs> I am the deputy director now um, for the Division of um, Kidney Health. I'm also joined, um, as you can see, with uh, Krishna Patel. She's our management analyst in our, within our Division of Kidney Health. Um, and you know, just wanted to, again, thank Dr. Norman, Tanya Smith, and others um, for this wonderful presentation today. Um, we really look forward to kind of um, doing a few things with you and I'll share with you with you know what we have in terms of our agenda. So on the next slide, again, you'll see us um, uh, featured there in front of you. Um, we've both been at CMS for a few years now, um, Krishna and I, as you see the two slides with the both of us on there. And we really enjoy the work that we do here at CMS. Um, you know, not just the regulatory and policy side of things, but also reaching the patient, we get a chance to talk to patients, understand where they are, um, get a chance for them to buy into our work as well as for them to contribute to our work. And so they do that in various and different capacities within our division of kidney health through our contractual work that we have. Um, they sit on panels as patients sneeze and others to really contribute to the work within the, the, within the work of the federal government within a, within a CMS. And we really value that. Um, as you see here today what we're going to talk we're going to talk about and um, and we'll you'll we'll hear a, you'll hear a, a series of things um, on the slide that says topics you'll see we'll talk a little bit about our CMS strategy um, we'll talk a little bit more about our current CMS COVID-19 efforts as it relates to obviously patients dialysis facilities other stakeholders um, that really in that that's really been happening that's really been coming together and trying to do the best that we can do for our um, for our patients and and caregivers and family members that's been impacted by our, our national pandemic and then we're um, also going to talk about give a little bit of background in terms of our um, our current initiatives that we have through our ESRD Treatment Choices Learning Collaborative. So Krishna Patel is going to talk us through that a little bit. You'll hear her in a minute talk about that right after me. And then um, we'll talk about some shared resources and kind of conclude it in that way. Um, so you'll hear from me talk about the first um, two areas. Krishna Patel will talk about the background and um, initiatives and then circle back with me in terms of shared resources, just to kind of give you a good flavor on the next the next series of voices that you hear. So as I mentioned, we'll talk a little bit about our CMS um, strategic goals. So our strategic goal at CMS, one of our major goals is really, as you see here on the screen, um, the CMS strategy is really built on one goal, putting our patients first. Um, one thing we have to do is to make sure that we are doing the right thing. And, and the right thing to do is really no one has a greater stake in healthcare improvement than our patients. Next slide. And so as you're looking at the slide now that says current CMS COVID-19 initiatives. Now, there are a series of items and series of events that we at CMS had to do as it related to the COVID-19 impact. Um, obviously, this pandemic has affected everyone, right? And with that, there are lots of regulatory and administrative things at, with the, at the federal government within us, within for us, I'll speak for ourselves, the CMS team. Um, we had to do and work feverishly on, on a series of items. And one of those things had to do with care, con care continuity. Um, we had to go through a series of regulatory waivers and push those out. And then we also had to think about and do um, items as it relates to infection surveillance and control. So I'll break down some of these three, three items here that, um, that we've done in terms of COVID-19 and the impact there. So next slide. On the slide that has care con continuity, now during our pandemic, 
um, this public health emergency, it was really a challenge for a lot of us. And it really included a lot of difficulties with staffing, supplies, um, access to hospital infrastructure and transportation. Um, a lot of these things you've heard on the news, right? And so one of the things, our goal was really to ensure that care of our beneficiaries, our Medicare beneficiaries were was not interrupted or interrupted as little as possible. OK, um, so the things that we had to do, we had to look at transportation. We knew that those things were um, really um, key and important for our beneficiaries to get to their care. So um, due, to, due really to the suspension of the public transportation in many areas, um, we had to make sure that we were getting our patients to their appointments and making sure that it was less difficult. So what we had to do was um, our, through our CMS ESRD network organizations, and we had 18 national organizations that really teamed together with other federal agents, uh, other federal, um, our federal stakeholders. And we were able to really work together to really identify the areas and put facilities, Dallas's facilities in touch with state authorities to really provide the services as it relates to transportation. Lots of tedious um, work, but we made sure that that happened. And um, in terms of dialysis vascular access, we wanted to, we wanted to, we, oh, excuse me, for the dialysis access, those procedures really became classified as elective procedures in numerous locations. So one of the things, the difficult decisions that we really needed to do and consider was that the ESRD patients, you know, they had to get fistulas, they had to get the peritoneal um, dialysis catheters, um, which, which greatly increased the, the, the dialysis safety. So we work with we work with our stakeholders. We develop language really to con to support and endorse that these procedures were not elective, and that they should and that we needed to publish. Um, we did publish actually information as relates to infections control and and guidance. So we needed to make sure that our patients were getting that and getting the getting the the the, the their vascular access um, procedures as they needed it. So we, we really worked to make sure that that was, um, and push this to show our support in that area. Now under the regulatory waivers on the next slide, you'll see three categories as it relates to regulations and which will require waivers in order to deliver the safe care and decrease provider burden during the public health emergency. And so we, we worked on surveys, uh, telehealth and quality measurement. So within the area of surveys, on March 20 of 2020, uh, and this was a critical time period for lots of folks, right when the pandemic was, um, you know, shutting, shutting, shutting down buildings and things like that across the country because of the pandemic. Now, at that particular time, we realized at CMS that, you know, and we, re we released guidance for prioritization and suspension of certain survey activities. Now, that's a regulatory um, area that we needed to make sure that we wanted to make sure, put the focus on what needed to be done. And that particular survey is really under our, um, our, our section um, 1135 of the Social Security Act, which CMS prioritized and, um, you know, we, we prioritize and suspended certain federal and state survey agents, sur survey agency surveys and really delayed the revisit, excuse me, we, did, we delayed um, the, the revisit of surveys um, as well as um, uh um, looking at, you know, the, the, the certified provider and, su and supplier types. We also tried to make sure that we were minimizing the impact of the dialysis facility operations and activities. So what we did was we issued a number of um, survey considerations um, during that time um, and looked at and started to target more, fo more focusedly, um, look at in our targeted infection control surveys and really try to take a, pl a closer look at that. Um, now, these considerations really included uh, waivers that were that provided some relaxation to some of those um, those administrative deadlines to really have those facilities really focus on patient care. Um, so that the, in terms of surveys, we we put out some 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 language there to kind of relax that for that particular time period. For telehealth, um, we knew inter hemodialysis requires any in-person physician visit monthly, um, and home dialysis requires an in-person visit quarterly. We looked at those requirements. We heard the patients again, as I mentioned in the very beginning of the call. We we, we were meeting with patients um, who who provides. Um, 
uh, very candid um, information and content and recommendations and feedback to us as CMS. And we heard them. We heard the providers and we heard it all. And what the things that we did is that we issued 1135 waivers to allow for these visits to be done via telehealth. We also produced an ESRD specific um, telehealth toolkit that was published um, to really assist providers. Um, we looked at quality measurement. That's another area that we really focus on. So we also provided additional waivers that were exempting dialysis facilities from reporting to the ESRD um, quality incentive program, which we all, which we call as, um, you know, we like here in the government, like calling all these acronyms, but QUIP. Um, and then also a, di a dialysis um, facility compare um, site. So we, we we relaxed some efforts there and provided some waivers um, for our facilities in terms of reporting during that time period. So on the next slide, you'll see infection surveillance control. This is the, the last part of the areas that we did for COVID-19. And so what we did is, you know, we, we took some action um, in terms of our um, we're calling CASER program, the Kidney Community Emer Emergency Response Program. And that particular program is really under contract with us, CMS. Um, and it provides technical assistance to our ESRD and stage renal disease networks. As I mentioned, there are 18 ESRD networks nationally. Um, and and we, we work with other groups to really ensure that they were timely and efficient um, ways of really looking at disaster preparedness, response, and recovery um, for the kidney community. We also organized calls. Um, it really included a lot of work, a lot of the interaction, collaboration with all of our dialysis organizations, um, CDC. Um, we also worked with ASPR, which is the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response in HHS. Uh, we work very closely with our colleagues, obviously, at CDC. Um, they are the gurus, are, are um, you know, the ones that's kind of leading the charge in terms of developing testing protocols, um, which all of the protocols are all listed on, C on the CDC website. And we made sure that those things were posted, shared, and, um, and also um, performed in the appropriate way within our dialysis facilities. And then we also, um, I think, you know, CMS is, you know, uniquely able to really monitor our dialysis facilities that were set up, right, to be um, in isolation or cohort um, facilities. And we directed all of our 18 networks across the country um, to provide a targeted technical assistance on infection control procedures. and. Um, you know, I can go on and on and talking about infection surveillance and control, but this, these were really key critical areas, you know, as it relates to the work and the impact that, um, you know, we've done so far. Um, the, work isn't, the work is not done. You know, we have lots of work more to do um, as we continue through this um, public health emergency. But, you know, these are just some of the, the steps that we've taken. Now, um, on the next slide uh, that's entitled Other Current Initiatives, one of the things that, you know, as I mentioned, we were contract, we are, we have um, a contractual agreement with all of our 18 networks that, you know, have been designed, that were designed over 30 plus years. Um, it goes all the way back, I think it's 1986, um, through a, a, a statutory requirement um, set forth in uh, the Social Security Act. I think it's 1881C specifically that really enables um, 18 networks um, to um, provide a quality improvement across the nation. And so we have um, contractual agreements with 18 networks. Um, and, um, and what we do is we task are to be conducted by the ESRD network um, uh, uh, networks. And they really work to really look at quality improvement and um, this year we had to, you know, really have to pivot our work to really ensure that our ESRD networks are really amplified in a way to focus on home modality and transplant. And our ESRD networks really work with dialysis facilities and patients. And two of the things that were, you know, that they are focused very clearly on is really increasing the number of patients on a transplant wait list, as well as increasing the number of patients on home modality. And so there are many other things that our ESRD network organizations are doing, but I'll just, I'm, I'm just wanted to pay close attention to those two just for the purpose of this call. 
And so, um, you know, our, our ESRD network organizations are set up very, like, as I mentioned, it's set up very uniquely. It's set up very focused. Um, you know, they, they do look at um, reducing bloodstream infections. They look at um, uh, reducing uh, long-term care rates. They look at population health projects, very specific and focused population health projects, um, whether it's dealing with folk rehab, hospitalization utilization. There's a lot of peer mentoring through patients. Um, there is work as it relates to, as I mentioned, transplant home, um, patient experience of care and, and other things like that. I'll be happy to talk through and send you more information if you want to learn a little bit more about our ESRD network program. But at this point in time, as I mentioned in our beginning of the call, I wanted to um, uh, hand it off to my colleague, Krishna Patel, who's going to take us on the, if you turn to the next slide, it deals with um, the background of our ESRD treatment choice and learning collaborative. So Krishna, I'll um, let you take it from here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Melissa. And Dr. Norman, I pulled out my old gear from college so I can join you with um, some Michigan gear. Have a ton of that. So thank you all and thank you for allowing us to come and present um, a little bit more about the ETC program. So on July 10th, 2019, President Trump signed an executive order to launch the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative. The goal of this executive order is to help increase transplants, prevent kidney failure through better diagnosis, treatment, and preventative care, increase affordable alternative treatment options, educate patients on treatment alternatives, and encourage the development of artificial kidneys. This initiative is housed under the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation Group, and they have a learning and diffusion model test. And this initiative is a collaboration between both CMS and the Health Resources and Services Administration, also known as HRSA. So between these two organizations, we'll be implementing the kidney transplant learning component, which is a subsection of the end-stage renal disease treatment choices model. And the Division of Kidney Health, which will be managing this particular learning collaborative was established in November of 2019 to continue to drive progress and results through this particular collaborative. Uh, next slide, please. So here you can see um, just various data points about the ESRD program. Close to 520,000 patients are currently on dialysis. The number of patients diagnosed with ESRD grows by nearly 15 to 20,000 patients annually, and ESRD patients make up just a small portion of the Medicare population, less than 1% to be exact, and they're an extremely vulnerable and expensive population. They actually account for 7% of Medicare fee-for-service spending, and Medicare funds close to $33 billion per year for dialysis. In addition to the major cost savings, Kidney transplants provide far greater health outcomes for patients and immeasurable quality of life impacts. Next slide. So this chart from um, a study done in 2018 shows the comparison of patient survival for transplantation versus dialysis. So data points one, two, three, and four show a high performing transplant program a mid-level performing transplant program, a less than average performing transplant program, and those remaining on dialysis. What we see here is that receiving a transplant at a transplant program at any level of performance offers better outcomes than remaining on dialysis. After three years, transplanted patient survival ranged from close to 93 to 96% compared to dialysis, which was at 79%. At the five-year mark, transplanted patient survival ranged from 87 to 92%, compared to dialysis, which was at 66% at that time. So this, this really does put that into perspective of the extreme benefits of transplantation versus dialysis. Next slide. So the three key goals for CMS on transplantation and organ utilization are to one, 
increase the number of ESRD patients who get listed for transplants. Two, help more ESRD patients get kidney transplants. And this one is extremely important, as I mentioned in the previous slide, greater quality of life, improved health outcomes, and a cost savings of Medicare of close to $100,000 per patient. And then finally, to spread best practices of high-performing donor hospitals, OPOs, and transplant centers. This helps pursue every available donation opportunity, reduce discard rates, and successfully transplant high KDPI kidneys, which are three very, very important elements of um, the ETC Learning Collaborative. Next slide. These are just a list of stakeholders that we've been reaching out to and requesting their support and commitments to the aims of this initiative. As mentioned earlier, this is definitely an all hands on deck approach and we would welcome any other stakeholders that you think would be beneficial for the ETC Learning Collaborative. We'd be happy to engage with them and um, you know, open any lines of communication. And next slide. I'm gonna turn it back over to Melissa to just provide some closing comments. Thank you, Krishna. Um, and thank you for the wealth of information that you've provided there in terms of our learning collaborative. We're excited about that work and, uh, and the partnership that you have. Um, this kind of takes us to the conclusion of our presentation today. We wanna thank each of you for listening. Um, we kind of look forward to our continued partnership with MOTAP. Um, and if you have any additional questions, we wanted to um, give you our email address, which is the best time to reach us, best way to reach us, mechanism to reach us now with the, um, with the, the public health emergency. And a lot of us are not in the offices, but we are available via email to you at any point in time. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the call, um, I wanted to make sure that you do have some resources at your fingertips. Um, as Krishna was conveying to you the ESRD treatment choice model and the learning collaborative that we have here at CMS and the work that's going to happen there, we wanted to provide you with the first hyperlink that you see on your screen, um, which is again, the end-stage renal disease treatment choices model. Um, there's a hyperlink there. It'll tell you everything you want to know about that. And then we also have the final rule that's associated with um, that uh, ESRD treatment choice model um, and lots of content respect, respective there. Um, it talks a little bit about our Medicare specialty care um, models that we have to really look at uh, QC, which is our quality of care and reducing expenditures, which is really key to us, really cost savings, but also really making sure that we are um, taking care of the patient and improving quality of care. So um, again, in conclusion from um, us here at CMS, our Division of Kidney Health, um, we, we are really striving to make sure that we are demonstrating, um, you know, active participation in our ESRD, with active active participation of our ESRD patients as empowered and keeping them informed participate, participants in our renal community. We want to continue to promote home modalities and transplantation as appropriate um, treatments um, to support their patient independence and improve the clinical outcomes. We also want to make sure that we are continuously looking at innovative, identifying innovative approaches um, and improving our kidney health of our Medicare beneficiaries and showcasing best practices for improving our um, quality of care, which is key and important for us, for our ESRD patients. Um, as I mentioned, I think there's been a running thread of this. We want to make sure that we are looking at safety and the continuity of care, especially in these emergency situations. So um, we want to make sure that we're doing the right thing. I kind of take us duck tail us back to our CMS main goal and the main the main thing um, in terms of our strategy um, is putting the patients first. We thank you again, um, Dr. Norman, Tanya Smith, and others that are listening near and far. Thank you for the time and opportunity that you've provided um, Krishna um, Patel and myself, Melissa Dorsey from CMS of Division of Health. The Division of Kidney Health. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you both, uh, Deputy Director <laughs> and, uh, and Ms. Patel. Um, wonderful presentation. I think highlighting um, uh, really this this three part uh, 
structure that, that lets transplant work between CMS, the transplant centers and donor hospitals and our organ procurement organizations. Um, and excited, I think this ETC model has a lot of uh, possibility to really improving the care uh, we deliver. Um, if there were one or two most important things you'd want people to take away from your talk or remember about the ETC model, uh, what might those be, uh, if, you know, for the general community? Krishna, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, I, great question. I think it is something that is in procurement right now, so I can't give too many details on specifics, but Overarchingly, I think the one thing that we're really trying to aim at is to improve transplantation rates. Um, that is a huge priority for the agency and something that this model will definitely be working on. And secondly, is to reduce discard rates. You know, that is a huge problem that we've been seeing throughout this process and something that we are heavily trying to correct and mitigate and make better. Excellent. And these models uh, start in January, is that correct? So, the yeah, the final rule was released um, a month ago. So that link is in the last slide of this deck. So you can look through that. In terms of the ETC model, um, we don't have a time frame yet, but it will be coming soon. Okay, wonderful. And I think you sent some great links so people can learn more about uh, uh, the process as it goes on. Are there going to be any community facing events uh, related to educating people about uh, these changes? Or yes. even educating providers about the changes? There, there will be a ton of resources, definitely webinars, probably for the next year, depending on how COVID goes, but um, there will be a lot more information once we're able to provide it. Yeah, and, and, what, and what we'll do, Dr. Norman, is, you know, once things are official, as uh, Krishna mentioned, we are in the sensitivity area of, um, of procurement. But once things are official, we'll make sure that your organization as well as others. So we'll do that through you and just make sure that um, our content and everything like that is pushed through you. So we'll make sure that you'll be one of our um, folks that's listed on that stakeholder page. We'll add you, uh, add you all on there and get the information out and start to communicate appropriately and have some frequent touch points with you along the way. Great, great. Well, thank you again for a great uh, presentation. Thank you for uh, that Michigan hat. I know that Dr. Mm -hmm. Denny is, is envious, um, but great presentations. We appreciate you joining us today and thank you for all the great information. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, be safe. Thank you. Um, and now as we uh, start to wrap up, I just want to take a moment to thank uh, everyone who participated today. I want to thank uh, Dr. Brown, uh, Dory Dills. I want to thank all of our presenters, uh, Paul Wise, Dr. Simpson. Um, um, I want to thank uh, uh, Ms. Patel and then Deputy Director uh, Dorsey for a great uh, set of presentations, uh, great comments uh, from the audience. And I uh, want to appreciate the audience for your participation and for your continued participation. Uh, we're 10 years in, and we hope to see you for another 10 years. Um, and before we close, I want to hand things back over to uh, my colleague, uh, Stacy Brand, uh, to bring us home. Thank you, Dr. Norman. I agree. It was a wonderful program. So thank you for moderating. So first, I want to announce the prize drawing winners. Everyone is waiting for this. So I'm going to pull up the slides with our winners. So our Bell Tire $50 gift card is going to go to Deborah Hodge Morgan. Um, our $50 gift card to Run Detroit is to Jill Best. $25 gift certificate to Ashka Hair Salon for Carrie Pratt. And another $25 gift certificate to Ashka Hair Salon for uh, Cassie Stewart. So all of these items will be mailed within the next two weeks. Um, so congratulations to all of you on those prizes. A couple other things to note. Um, next week, there'll be the social determinants of health how my neighborhood determines my health. It's gonna be on Thursday, October 15th at one o'clock. And that can be found on the Gift of Life Michigan Facebook page, the Gift of Life Motep Facebook page, as well as on YouTube. So we hope that you will join us for that. 
And then I want to thank everyone for attending today to all of our presenters and moderators over the past two days. It's been a wonderful symposium and we're looking forward to next year. Save the date, March 18th through 19th. It'll be another virtual symposium. So we'll look forward to seeing you again. And please be sure to complete our evaluation and to claim your credits online so you can get your certificate by using the QR code or going to mycme.medicine.umich.edu, which is the same site that you used when you registered for the program. So thank you again to everyone, um, to Gift of Life Motep and to Michigan Medicine. It's been a wonderful program and we're looking forward to next year. Have a wonderful weekend.